Welcome to Program Directors 101, um, which is uh, the first APDR session at least I've been at today. Uh, we have a variety of different speakers here today. It's mostly focusing on the accreditation system and the milestones. We're also going to have some stuff on the interventional, um, new interventional residency. Um, starting today is Brandy Nicholson, who's going to talk to us about the next accreditation system. Thank you. Good morning. So yes, I'm Brady Nicholson. I'm from the University of Virginia. And I'm going to try to summarize in about 20 minutes the next accreditation system as a whole. And that's a big task to accomplish. So I really just want to hit the high points and hopefully um, generate some ideas uh, for you as you go through the meeting this week that might spark discussions between you and some of your colleagues so that you can better understand the program and ask those appropriate questions. So I want you to go away from this talk understanding the components of the next accreditation system and take away some key points that would help you successfully um, succeed in satisfying those requirements and hopefully identify those areas you want to avoid so that you um, don't reach any of those pitfalls and not um, be successful. So the ACGME gave us the six domains of clinical competency in 1999. And in 2009, they started envisioning this next accreditation system. And they melded those six clinical competencies into the 12 milestones that we know today and wanted us to focus more on the outcomes of how we educate our residents. And the NAS was phased in for us specifically and a few other programs this last year in July of 2013. So we're in the midst of it now. And as you've been going through it and reading more information and uploading your milestone data, you might have recognized that you don't quite understand the entire process, seen some new words that um, are not familiar to you and are a little bit anxious about the annual reporting that's coming up at the end of this academic year. So hopefully this will help a little bit alleviate some of those fears. The goals of the NAS are a lot of positive ones. Change is always hard and a little intimidating, but if you think about the motivation as to why the change has been put into place, it'll help you sort of join the bandwagon and actually be excited about it and move forward. We're trying to improve how we prepare our physicians for real life practice when they finish our programs. And we're gonna do this in a more outcomes method so that we can say they, we've taught them to get to a certain point, they've reached that milestone and they can check it off and they can accomplish these outcomes. And that's how we're going to be accredited going forward. It is supposed to be a less burdensome process the PIF is no longer there. It's no longer going to be a rapid, um, you know, a getting your crew together to get all your information in place and having certain people come to your site and just sort of checking you every three to five years to make sure you're doing it right. And if you weren't aware of a deficiency, then it becomes um, a much bigger deal at that point. This is supposed to be a continual sort of smooth process along the way. And the real outcome of this is supposed to make good programs um, even better and allow them to share the things that they are doing excellently with those other programs that may not be excelling in certain areas. And because it's a more continual accreditation, we're hoping to identify those programs that may not be performing as well more quickly and to come in and to make improvements faster and sooner. And ultimately, it's our public that are going to hold us accountable for this. And if you remember, the ACGME has a lot of stakeholders that they represent. It's not only us so that we can say you know, to our residents, we need you to do X and Y, because that's sort of protecting us and giving us good uh, trainees. But also, we're, their um, motivation is to protect those residents so that we withhold standards and teach them certain things so that they can be good physicians. But the public, the payers, the government, all those things play a role, and that's why all these changes have come forward. You may have seen the new core program um, requirements that will be coming out in 2016. There's some new vocabulary here. The different requirements now include the core and the detail, which have been there, but those detail ones are where we can innovate and be different. So if your residents and your program can satisfy the core requirements, then you can do something unique and different under the detail ones. And that's what makes this sort of exciting. And now there's outcome requirements as well that are sort of, you know, measuring the actual accomplishments of your residents and your trainees. This is where we can innovate and have a little more fun as we train our residents. There are many things about the new system that are similar to the old. We still have some factual data that we have to upload to the ACGME and share with our residency review committees includes our scholarly activities, the case log data, the program surveys that we do on an annual basis, and many other things. But there are some nuances to these that are important for you to be aware of. 
The way that we're going to be sharing the CVs of our um, teaching faculty and our residents is a little bit different. They now want the PubMed numbers of the um, actual scholarly activity and the published um, papers that your core faculty and your residents um, have published. There are other ways to satisfy those scholarly activities, and you can find them on the ACGME website. So remind that your residents, they can publish and they can present an abstract, they can even speak just at your own institution in a research week. There are many ways to satisfy these things. But how you're going to be sharing that information with the RRC and the ACGME is a little different. And your core faculty, be reminded, are those that spend at least 15 hours teaching your residents and or in educational administrative duties. And those are the only faculty that now you need to share information to the RRC about. And your CVs just need to be related to the last academic year. Another difference that we've seen in the last couple years, so this is one you should be aware of, are who does the annual surveys. All of your residents now need to complete those annual surveys since 2012, but only your core faculty have to participate. And the goal, of course, is 100% participation. So make sure within your institution that your core faculty know who they are and give them heads up that they will be asked to complete the survey. And then there are the more significant differences with the new system. Milestones, there are several lectures within the um, week that are going to be centered on milestones, so I'm going to very briefly touch on that. The self-study visits are when the RRC comes to your site to evaluate your program. And the clinical learning environment review, or the CLEAR, which is something very different, and so I'll go into that with more detail. And again, no PIF, that's a good thing. We can focus on all of those positives. This is a more continuous accreditation. You're going to be sharing information back and forth with the RRC and ACGME, semi-annually for the milestones, and then annually for all of those more um, factoid information about the progress of the residents in your program um, and your evaluations and your scholarly activity and any program changes. And those, those pieces of information are going to determine sort of the frequency of your um, self-study visits and have impacts on the, the clear site data information as well. So milestones. Because I'm talking about sort of ways to be more successful, I just wanted to include a couple points to this. The APDB, APDBR has um, the website here that has lots of resources related to the milestones. There was a subcommittee formed within the APDR that sat down with a group of physicians and they tackled these 12 milestones and they created information and put it into a central database. And you can get to this even without membership to the website. And if you click on one of these resources, and I chose scholarly activity, you'll see that you come into a similar appearing um, layout of information for each one of these 12. At the top, it shows you um, the program, I'm sorry, the milestone specific for diagnostic radiology. And at the bottom, there's additional information that you might find very beneficial as you're trying to help your residents accomplish the milestones. There's educational strategies for the different levels for each of the milestones, as well as suggested educational materials. And I envision that this is going to grow over time as we share amongst ourselves those educational resources and materials that we have at our own institutions, and also as we develop new ones, potentially as PQI, SBI projects going forward. We recently got an email about the business essentials category of the JACR, and that may be a wonderful tool that we could use for our residents to help educate them towards healthcare economics. And I know there's going to be more and more of those things coming forward. So check out this site. Go there frequently because it may help you with the milestone accomplishments. The Clinical Competency Committee is a very important part, uh, part of the milestones and an aspect within your programs that you probably have underway now. They should have met a handful of times already. You would have done your first reporting in December for milestones. And at that point, you probably recognized areas that you could improve on within your own programs and hopefully have started working on those processes for your spring semester. These committees can vary in size with a minimum of three people. At our institution, we have nine. Our program director is involved, but he cannot be the chair. So remember, as you assign faculty, who can be in charge and who cannot. And mainly their charge is to take the evaluations, the feedback from faculty, and the milestone results of the residents, compile them together, see which residents are succeeding, which ones may not be, and make recommendations to the program director to the status of those residents and whether they should be moving forward um, and or do they need any disciplinary action within your program. And then the program director will use that information to give feedback to the residents on a semi-annual basis. 
So what I would suggest to successfully navigate the milestones are to can go to the rest of the talks at this meeting, share information amongst yourselves. When you select your CCC members at your program, do so with diligence. Get feedback from those faculty to ensure they want to maintain engagement and participate. I would suggest that your evaluations be milestone-based. Most of ours were, and where it was challenging were those that had not yet been sort of updated and revised, because it was hard to translate two different languages so that we could fill out the ACGME um, level and milestone data. And then continually revisit methods for how you can com um, complete the milestones for those non-interpretive skills. It's pretty straightforward to know whether residents have medical knowledge, can dictate a report, can do a procedure, but some of those other things can be challenging. And I think this will continue to grow and get easier as we practice. All right, the self-study visits. This is, I think, overall most similar to what we um, currently know. The small group of personnel from the RRC are gonna come to your program and they're gonna make sure that what you're saying that you've been doing on your annual um, submissions of data is actually what's happening at your institution. We've all been talking about how it will be exciting that they will be coming less frequently, maybe as infrequently as every 10 years. You're gonna have adequate time to prepare, much like the old system, and hopefully the preparation will be much less. This is where that burden should be um, less onerous, because you've already been providing all the data and you just need to put it together in small terms in a short document. And I think we still need to learn what that document will look like, and those visits will be starting soon so we can continue to share sort of what the process was like for us. You might get called, though, to have a targeted or diagnostic visit. And this would be true if your annual data submission just doesn't quite line up, or there's a delinquency that they recognize in the RRC, and they want to come to your program to sort of see if they can help solve problems. The one main difference, I think, about these visits compared to the old way is you're going to get feedback while they're there in your department. There's going to be an exit interview where they tell you what they noticed and also give you suggestions for improvement. So we're no longer going to be waiting for a letter to come a few weeks later wondering if we had any citations or what is our accreditation cycle. So ultimately, I think this will be a much more realistic and fair process and one in which we will all benefit from and be able to improve our programs more quickly. There will be less notice for this. However, if you already have in the back of your mind that there might be something that you're sharing with the RRC that's not quite right, you could anticipate potentially a call to schedule one of these. So know your common program requirements and the core requirements. Be thinking how you might innovate with your detail requirements. It's the ends that are being evaluated, not as much the process. So you can have some flexibility there. Make sure you have good record keeping. If they want to know that you've accomplished the outcomes, make sure that you're documenting it and keeping it organized in a way that you could pull it together quickly. And then be aware of your own progress more frequently throughout the year so that you aren't aware of a delinquency that you have to then share with the RRC that you don't have time to fix before the annual reporting period comes to pass. And finally, the clear. This was very new. It is ongoing now. Potentially someone in the room might have been an alpha site or a beta site where these things have started to occur. But basically this came into existence because of a response of the ACGME to the Institute of Medicine report in 2003 that talked about duty hour violations and the workload of our trainees and patient safety being potentially related. So the idea for the CLEAR was started in 2011 and came to be in 2012. And the goal is to visit different training institutions and recognize and identify the characteristics of what they do to teach their trainees about patient safety and healthcare quality that are associated with good outcomes in those measures. And then they can put this data together and have a national pool of those characteristics that are successful so that we can ultimately improve patient care and healthcare quality within our training programs in hospitals. There are six factors that are gonna be evaluated by the CLEAR. They include things like supervision and um, you know, hierarchy of residents within your institution, professionalism, as well as the quality safety and patient outcome. There are three main components to the CLEAR. So you'll start to hear these words. There's the site visit. This is a different site visit than the self-study visit. So it's not RRC members. There is an evaluation committee within the CLEAR that is made up of persons who are experts in the field of patient care, professionalism, who are going to come and evaluate your program. The CLEAR is also going to provide for programs faculty and leadership development tools and opportunities. 
So they want you to be good at it, but they're also going to give you the resources so that you can improve in these areas. There are tons of resources about this and links to articles and um, PDFs and PowerPoints on the ACGME website. And because this is one of the newest things and might be um, still sort of abstract and not understandable by all, I would highly suggest that you check out the website because there's a lot of information there that will break it down and make it more clear for you. The clear site visits are going to occur every 18 to 24 months at each program. And it's not the outcomes of these meetings that are going to affect your accreditation, but just the fact that you participated. So in order to maintain your program's accreditation, you have to have had a site visit within the last 24 months. And the persons who are going to be involved in this site visit at your own institution are going to be all of your leadership personnel, so your program director, um, your designated institutional officer, people who are in charge of potentially like your QA meetings and patient safety within your institution. So <clears throat> the alpha testing, like I said, has completed. You can see this table from one of the publications related to an update on the clear shows the white circles were where the alpha sites were done. So it was just a small number of institutions. They wanted to make sure that the questions they asked related to patient safety and the other six factors actually got them the information that they needed to be able to evaluate a program. These are going to be short notice meetings, so they also wanted to find out that if they told the program we're coming in 10 days, that that program could organize those leaders, get them in the same room, and have them available to meet with the education committee from the CLEAR, which can be challenging because these people are busy and are often not immediately available for large meetings. They also wanted to know if they could turn around the information that they gathered at these meetings within a couple days and before they left the institution, have an exit interview with those people and give them feedback as to where they're excelling and where they might have difficulties. And all of that went well. The beta testing is currently undergoing, I think they've maybe been to about 100 sites. And this was to see if they could do it on a larger scale, calling more programs with a 10-day notice, turning around the information, coming back and then being able, as the clear committee, to go back and go out to another program within a couple weeks and start the process over again and also to get feedback from the programs that it was doable, fair, that they benefited from it, and that they relatively enjoyed the process and learned something from it to improve how they're tackling patient safety and quality improvement. And so far, the feedback um, has been positive. So you might be getting a phone call coming your way in the near future because they are moving forward on this. And so over the next academic year, I would anticipate that some of us will hear from the CLEAR committee and be told that within a couple weeks, they're going to be coming to an institution near you. You can find information on how to prepare for that visit on the ACGME website. If you go to the website and look under the CLEAR tab, you'll find a lot of handouts. Specifically, this one is instructions on notes for preparing for the CLEAR. It has suggested paperwork that you should have together and ready to um, present to the education committee. It has a list of those required and those potentially optional leadership personnel in your institution that would be and need to be available on a relative moment's notice to participate. It tells you sort of which site, if you have more than one, would be the best place to have them come and do walking rounds. Where should the meeting rooms be within your department? How large should they be? And what should the flow of the day be? So I highly suggest you go to this, print it out, look at it, um, and prepare yourself so that you have these things sort of on hand and that you've reached out to those leaders within your institution so that they know that if this is about to happen that you're going to notify them and sort of get the ball rolling to prepare. Two main ways I think to succeed specifically to the CLEAR is one, to educate your residents and your faculty about quality improvement and patient safety. We have several things at the University of Virginia that are specific within our own department. Our residents all participate you know, in the QA meetings, they submit cases. Of course, they all participate in a system-based practice project. We try to have every PQI project that a faculty is on to have a resident with them so that they can learn from those who have done cases before them and, and can apply it more to clinical practice. There are always institutional meetings available. Um, at UVA, there's, a, you know, the fatigue lecture, for instance, is done a couple times in the year by the institution, so we send our residents to those lectures. So you don't necessarily have to duplicate the process on everything. And then not only in preparing your residents to be knowledgeable about this and ensuring that you're educating them on this, 
which benefits both preparing them for evaluation on this, but also improving patient care, you need to prepare for the meeting. So get that sheet, sort of go through a dry run in your head. If the R, or not the ROC, but if the CLEAR was to call us tomorrow, would we be ready and would we have our ducks in a row so that we could have a successful meeting? And I think if you do that intermittently through the year to ensure that your information is up to date, then you'll have success with that. So overall, in a nutshell, I know this is a very superficial sort of uh, introduction to the next accreditation system, but it's a good start. You've now heard all the words. You've heard ways to be best prepared for it. Join the APDR. And if you're not a member, you will get more information on that website if you are. But many of these resources we have put in front of the sort of password protected wall because we know you would all benefit from them. We have a new LinkedIn site where you could blog with colleagues. Um, there's been a few topics related to this already, and that could become a great resource for sharing ideas. The ACGME website has all the tools that you need, and if you forget the definitions of, definition of something, just go to that site and read it again. Engage your clinical competency committee because they're going to be vital at your success with the milestones and your evaluations of your residents, which is going to be used in order to determine whether you might need a targeted or diagnostic visit. So if you can do it right the first time, you'll be well ahead. Stay organized and inform the parties that matter, your residents and your core faculty. Take this information back to them. Ensure they understand the vocabulary. Your residents will succeed more and have better outcome data if they know what they're being evaluated on and that they understand the milestones and can fairly um, try to accomplish them. And then work with your GME office because they will also be a great resource because they're going through this for all of their programs as well and may have already visited something within surgery, anesthesia, or whatever and can help you apply it to your own program. There are many resources. I have a few of them here, of course, very small print for two seconds. Um, but if you have additional questions, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be here all week, and, then, and here's my email as well. Thank you very much. So we're going to hold questions to the end. We have some time set aside for that. Uh, we have had a clear visit at our institution, so if anybody wants to hear my experience, and if Steve Sargent is in the audience, his experience with that, we can let you know. Oh, that's not a good sign. Hang on. Wait. Let's try this one. Whew. Thought for a moment I'd lost it. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes is some of the ways you can try and implement the milestones. So what are my objectives for this talk? I hope to try and identify some of the major challenges which we faced trying to apply milestones to residency program hope to give you some type of understanding how you can apply milestones to the education of your residents, the design of your curriculum, um, the design of your rotation-based evaluations, as well as the biannual milestone assessments that we need to do, and then be able to effectively document these program milestone implementation and evaluation steps. So, you know, I don't think there's many people amongst us who sort of looked upon having the milestones as being this Yahoo, we have milestones to do now type event. But, you know, I've really tried to embrace them. Um, really look upon these as a means of improving the education and the evaluation of your residents and not just as another administrative step and another checklist of stuff that you've got to do and what's the minimum we can possibly do to get enough data into the ACGME so that we don't get a nasty gram. This is certainly not the gold standard that I'm going to tell you. This is just what we, as a small to medium-sized program, did to try and do this as effectively and as efficiently as possible. And, you know, we were given some pretty broad guidelines by RRC. Um, the APDR um, committees run by Angelisa Paladin have been hugely helpful, as Brandy just showed you, in giving you a small granular detail on that. But we really weren't told how to do this. We were told, this is what we need to do, but really not the finite step. So, you know, we've been making this up as we went along, I think reasonably effectively. Just to give you a little background, we're a 20 resident um, program. Uh, we're a rural academic practice that's affiliated to the Geisel School of Medicine. We have um, about 30 faculty of whom nearly a third are part-time, which has its own issues, and our program director is Steve Sargent. Um, I think that I'm correcting saying this, and I can get some input from the chair of the RRC later, um, but for the clinical competency committee, the program director does not have to be the chair, but they can be the chair, um, and they are in many programs. We elected not to have them the chair. 
Um, the number is of committee members is uh, program dependent. The more residents you have, generally speaking, the more members you want to have, so you can kind of divide up the pain a little bit. Um, we decided to have eight across the specialties. Uh, we also have a program coordinator as a non-evaluating member, and we also have our vice chair of quality assurance uh, and quality improvement as a non-evaluating member to provide some input there. Um, some programs have a physicist. I think we don't, but I think that we probably should start to incorporate one. So this, you need to um, provide written documentation of the role of your clinical competency committee. I presume this is something we've all done. We had to have this committee formed in July of last year. Um, so we should all have that written. And it is responsible for providing the biannual review and reporting to the ACGME and also advising our program director on individual resident progress any, um, whether they can be promoted to the next year, whether any remediation is needed or even potentially in those rare cases of a resident dismissal. Now, there were times when I decided that maybe being chair of the CCC was not such a good idea, and I think it was around about this time last year it was practically driving me to drink. But it's an important role. So the milestones, we tend to think about the evaluation end of the milestones, but milestones don't just include evaluation, they include teaching our residents. And this is a really good time when you're, if you haven't done it already uh, before the last block of milestones, think about doing it now, is to really sit and look at how you're teaching and how you're evaluating your residents in each of these different areas. So the first thing that we did is we developed a document and those of you who know me know that I love hyperlinked documents. So we developed a document where we went through each of our individual milestones in each of our individual specialties to look at these areas. And what we sat and lo we looked at and documented was how are we teaching each of those milestones in each of our clinical areas we went through for you know, CT and fluoro and nuclear medicine and so on. How can we teach it better in future what different modalities we might need, what teaching resources, whether we need to introduce new sessions into our curriculum. How are we currently evaluating those milestones? And for many of them, we were evaluating them to some degree. But what different types of evaluation methods should we be developing now or in the future to evaluate them better? So for example, to take the QI milestone, we looked at our current education, this was back in the last spring, and we found that actually we were doing a number of different things for quality improvement education. It's a big thing at Dartmouth, so it was to be expected we were doing some. And they went to a lot of meetings that were quality control related, they went to um, our, um, some of our risk assessment meetings and so on. But we decided we could definitely improve this. Uh, we required them to go to two Qantras meetings. Those are our um, incident reporting meetings in the institution. The Dartmouth Value Institute is all about quality control, and we decided that they're actually all going to get a yellow belt certification through that. We looked at the evaluation, and we found we weren't really evaluating this. Of course, we documented their QI projects, um, but there really wasn't anything much specific on QI evaluation. So we're going to improve that. We can obviously document their participation in meetings much better, and now they will actually have a proper yellow belt certification, which includes an exam. So to start with some of the low-hanging fruit, and we all know which those are. So we were, we were already pretty good at teaching and evaluating in these areas. So patient care, medical knowledge, and documenting scholarly activity is reasonably easy. But the first thing that we really needed to come up with was what I called the lists. The, the um, RRC very kindly left it very open as to the conditions, the protocols, and the procedures which each institution would define as being common or uncommon, basic, intermediate, and advanced, and so on, but realizing that these are going to vary significantly between different institutions. For example, at my institution, all residents become competent in doing stereotactic and ultrasound-guided breast biopsies, and that's not necessarily the same at every other institution. And I think this is much better than if they'd come out and said to us, you know, you have to teach them this, you have to, they have to see examples of all these conditions, these protocols, and so on. But you need to develop these lists for your own institution. So again, we had another hyperlink document where we came up with our milestones, conditions, our protocols, and our procedures within each individual specialty. And we were gonna use these as a guide for both teaching and evaluation. 
So for breast imaging, we came up with our list of common conditions shown here for level two um, evaluation for this milestone. We came up with our protocols for breast imaging, and we came up with our procedures for breast imaging at each of those basic, intermediate, and advanced levels. I highly recommend, if you haven't already, that you rewrite your evaluations to be in line with the milestones. Now, the RSC specifically said that the milestones are not meant to be an evaluation tool, and that's, this is not the same thing. We're not using the milestones template that we fill in on the website as our evaluation tool. We happen to have eValue, which frankly sucks when you come to do something like this. <laughs> and I've heard that new innovations is better, and you may have a different tool at your institution, but you can rewrite every single rotation evaluation so that it mirrors them. And it makes it so much easier when you come to do your biannual reviews if those are in line with it. However, they have to be rewritten for each specialty. Not all rotations have all milestones. Some of them do, some of them don't. We use those lists that I just told you about as the basis to incorporate them directly into our evaluation document so that the faculty could see them there right in front of them. We did individualize them as I'll show you for each rotation and we developed an abbreviated uh, evaluation that goes out to residents after, um, sorry, goes out to faculty after residents have done a weekend call and that has been an extremely um, useful document we found. So for example, here um, we're looking at um, the, which one is this? This is the protocoling, um, the rotation specific detail for consultant for breast imaging. And for each specific one, I'm just showing you a little snapshot here, but you can see that it's written within the value itself so the faculty can read it and say, oh yeah, they can absolutely do that rather than the more generic form. And they vary between the different rotations. So here is a comparison between consultant level one for breast imaging I'm not going to go through this, but you can see that it is dramatically different than consultant level one for the cardiothoracic rotation. But all of these are very specific, and they're very granular and finite. And again, this is, this is one of the cases where we look for substantive compliance. So we don't want someone going, okay, well, I'm not sure whether they can protocol CTA, the chest for the thoracic aorta, but I know that they can do the rest of the stuff. So it's substantive compliance with each of these for a level. We also developed our 360 evaluations that go out to the nursing and the technical staff, again, online with the milestones. They only have four to eight milestones, depending whether it's IR, fluoro, MAMO, and so on. Um, but they always include professionalism, and they always include both patient communication to patients and communication um, to clinicians and other staff. We changed how we did these. These used to be sent out to, as far as I could see, a fairly random number of technologists. And we changed this so that, so that the, um, at the monthly tech nursing and PA meetings, they will sit and discuss an individual resident and they will come up with a group consensus of this that gets submitted to us. And we took out a lot of the sort of interpersonal friction type issues by doing this. And you got input from a, a much wider range of um, the paramedical staff. What about procedural competency? Well, this is very institution dependent, as I said, and I think most institutions have probably developed some form of a sign-off list, whether it's a paper passport or it's electronic. Um, we elected to go electronic because I think that they, we feel they're probably gonna lose a, paper, a piece of paper that they have to keep with them for four years. Um, our residents all have iPads, so we set up a, a fairly straightforward survey monkey that works via their iPad, or it can be linked to from any computer. At the end of each rotation, they bring the iPad to the faculty and they get them to sign off electronically on specific procedures. We have a random check system where we will um, email a faculty and say, you know, did you sign off that Joe Bloggs was competent in doing a CT guided biopsy of the liver? Um, and they'll say, yes, yes, fine, I did. So it's, it's a fairly random thing that the residents are aware of. So for example, this is the one for neuroimaging. Um, and it says, you know, this resident's competent in forming the, the following procedures in your imaging, click, 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 depending on which rotation they're on, and then signed off by the faculty and it goes into a database. So what about the more challenging areas, that, that fruit at the top of the tree? Well, we know what those are as well. So I think these are the ones that we have all struggled with, professionalism, communication, healthcare, economics, QI, patient safety, and self-directed learning. So we looked at the milestones as given to us by RRC, ACGME for professionalism and self-directed learning, and we didn't feel they went far enough. 
um, we didn't feel that they um, covered as many areas as we really wanted to evaluate in both of these areas. So we really looked upon this as a means of trying to approve the evaluation of our residents. We tried to make them more inclusive, more specific. Um, so we developed standard criteria for the e-value that went across every different um, modality for both professionalism and self-directed learning. So the professionalism one includes elements of citizenship and work ethic and things like lecture attendance, and it, it clearly identifies development from the uh, through the levels beyond that of just are they a team player, do they lead a team, and so on, which is what's in the, the uh, basic milestones. But we do include all of those areas within them. Same for self-directed learning. I personally think that just fulfilling in their annual self-evaluation is not an adequate assessment of self-directed learning. So we developed a generic one that included reading and research, the depth of their study and investigation, um, whether they needed to be directed or whether they are spontaneously doing that, and again, showing progression through the different milestone levels. For QI, really, um, the rotation-based evaluations are only in MAMO and nuclear medicine. But as I said, they have to attend Quantrust meetings, the departmental projects, and obtain their um, yellow belt certification. For patient safety, uh, we linked up with Tufts and Long Island um, and North Shore. And between us, we developed a 50-question um, online quiz in patient safety, which our residents have to take annually. Um, our own institution decided what score cutoffs we were going to say that residents passed or failed or progressed to the second uh, different levels. In the Sim Center, there is a contrast. We have a simulation center, and they do an annual contrast reaction um, simulation. And then there's a variety of institutional modules in MR safety, radiation safety, which they have to fulfill. And then there is some evaluation on the rotations. For healthcare economics. Uh, we have developed a um, healthcare economics and business of medicine curriculum, um, and we use attendance at those conferences as well as some audience response pad questions. For communication to um, faculty, uh, we have the University of Florida developed a very nice online module which the residents have to complete. They also have an online based evaluation of at least three dictations a month. This is again run by a survey monkey, and all the faculty are requested to try and do at least one of these a month. So the CCC meeting, the biannual review. There's different ways of doing this. I'm just going to say the way we did it, it worked for us, it may not work for you. We divided our committee into pairs. Each resident, each couple had five residents which they were responsible for evaluating, and they did the majority of this evaluation before the, the, um, the major CCC meeting, and they reported to that meeting. We decided to divide our residents up by year, so each um, CCC committee peer was responsible for evaluating one year of residents, and they're going to stay with that year as they progress through the residency, because then we can identify progression of skills, or hopefully not regression of skills, I think much easier than if we're swapping around. Before we met, we developed um, some rules, um, which exam scores were adequate for someone to pass, what level of conference attendance, and we decided that for the majority of the milestones, the residents would not regress. So if they've reached a, several, a certain level of medical knowledge, they've reached level four, they're not going to become level three the next time. With the exception of professionalism, self-directed learning, and the annual safety quiz and simulation, because we felt these were areas that residents could effectively regress. You could have a resident who is very professional and now becomes unprofessional. And so in those, potentially, they could go up and down. Hopefully just up, but you know, I'm being a realist here. So our program coordinator developed a fairly substantive packet for us, it included all the values um, per milestone so we could see the individual, and they line up directly with the milestones. It makes it much easier, as well as the mean and the verbal comments, the scores from the exams, the completion of the multiple online modules that they have to do, their um, status for QI and scholarly projects, their conference attendance, um, and a summary of their procedural competency. And then uh, we had a, a worksheet which each of us sat down and we had one per resident and we went through each different evaluation in the each different areas um, of each of the different milestones and just checked it off, worked out where we were going to do and then came up with our final recommendation. How hard was the data? It was reasonable. 
But there's certain subjectivity, and obviously the discussion about that resident between the pair and to the committee is also key. So our initial review, we found, took 30 to 45 minutes per resident. Um, and then at the CCC meeting, which we held two one-hour meetings, it took about five minutes per resident. Some of them took one minute, and some of them took 15 minutes, as you might expect. But we really tried to focus on the issues. And at the end of this, we not only came up with our final ranking, our final scores that were going to be submitted to the ACGME website, but we came up with a list of recommendations for the program director, um, who is not part of the committee, for him to work on, I'm sorry, who is part of the committee and is there, but for him to work on further with the residents. What about resident self-evaluation? We haven't done this, um, but we're thinking of doing it. Consider having the residents evaluate themselves. Have them mark where they think they are on each of those milestones. Which level would you put them in? It's going to take them two minutes. And that document should be with the program director at the time of their biannual review. So they can sit down and say, well, you know, where did you think you were? Well, this is kind of interesting. You know, you thought you were level two. The committee thought you were level four or vice versa. Because I think that shows a lot of insight and reflection. Uh, we are also considering having resident-to-resident -resident professionalism evaluations. This was actually recommended by the residents. This came from them. What problems have we had? Well, no one likes change. And we've changed things a lot. We've changed our valuation schemes. There's been a learning curve. The evaluations for the residents are much longer. They're much more specific, which is helpful, but they actually have to read them. And we did have a number of faculty who went five, 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 five. And you know, we go back and say, you know, this is a first year resident. I mean, I'm not level five in half of these, and you know, haven't we do it? And then the same faculty member would do exactly the same for the next three months, so but they're, they're kind of there, though. So there's been a big faculty education component of this. You know, we do offer some carrots. Um, the number of um, evaluations that are completed on residents are a small component when assessing their annual incentive, um, and they know that, and that has improved the number of completions quite dramatically, I would say. And the program coordinator and myself did a lot of nagging. I felt like I had 20 kids at one point. Well, 22 if you count my real ones. 23 if you count my husband. It was <laughs> because we had to keep asking him, okay, we need the documentation on your scholarly ponet. We need you to complete these modules. We need you to do the online quizzes and so on. So there was a lot of nagging involved. The, for the senior residents, it's difficult. Um, you know, they had to sort of retrospectively document a lot of their competencies, for example. Um, there were a lot of things that they had to get done in a fairly short interval of time where other people were going to have four years to do. There are some uh, continued challenges, and I think that Harp's going to talk more about these later on. Uh, patient communication, um, I think this is very difficult to teach, and it's probably even more difficult to assess. Uh, we're thinking of doing some patient surveys. So, coming back to my original theme, <laughs> with a vodka bottle. You know, I'm an optimist, so try and look, look upon this as there really is an opportunity in the milestones for us to teach our residents better and really evaluate them better. So look upon it on a positive way. I'm more than happy to share any of um, the resources we've developed with anyone. Just drop me an email and you'll get sent a whole shabong of it. And um, we're gonna hold questions till the end. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to introduce Victoria Marks, who's going to talk about interventional radiology. Hi. Um, I want to thank Janet Bailey for the invitation to speak here today, I think. And I say that I'm a very experienced public speaker, but I've been in this crowd, and I know this is a tough crowd. So. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, interventional radiology as a primary specialty. What does it mean for the Diagnostic Radiology Program Director? And I have to admit that I do have some conflicts of interest when speaking on this topic. I am an interventional radiologist. I entered diagnostic radiology over 30 years ago, residency specifically to be an interventional radiologist, so I was on the early wave of this whole idea. And I am a Diagnostic Radiology Residency Program Director, and I love it. Um, so what does the new IR specialty mean for the Diagnostic Radiology Program Director? I've thought about this a lot. I've talked with Jean LeBurge a lot. Um, I've talked with Matt Morrow. I've been involved in many discussions of this. And I really don't know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At 
least I'm honest. Okay. Um, what it really means is a lot of change. A lot, a lot of change. And I can give you a diagnostic radiology residency program director's perspective on change. So let's talk about change a little bit. Well, there's change from the ABR. We all know the core exam was no big deal. And then as you can see in the uh, previous talk, the ACGME with the milestones and the new accreditation system, that's really no big deal. It hasn't changed our lives a bit. And there's other societal changes. I think recruitment to radiology residency is undergoing a little bit of stress right now. And I think there's stress in the job market. So there's a lot of changes and a lot of stresses on the program director's life and program coordinator's life um, to the point where sometimes I feel like these guys. And I bet I'm not the only program director in the room that feels like these guys. And most of the time when I see new change coming, I just go like this. I'm like a deer in the headlights. And what I realized going into this whole process of creating a new specialty and figuring out how to birth that specialty, I realized that I thought I was experiencing change fatigue. And I think a lot of program directors in diagnostic radiology may be experiencing change fatigue. And I thought I had invented a new diagnosis. But there's actually a fair amount of literature in the business literature on change fatigue Diagnose, I mean, uh, defining it as the perception that the rate of change is too frequent. And I think that that may be where we are right now. Um, so we kind of got to get past that and think about change in a positive way. Which brings me to the tagline for the AUR 2014 meeting, leadership and transformation effective, affecting positive change. And I see the specialty of interventional radiology as a very positive change. And we are amongst the people who have to make it real and affect it. So what are the components of positive change? Focus, leadership, pacing, participation, and communication. And it's going to take all of this to bring the specialty of interventional radiology into a positive reality. Um, so I'm going to start on focus, because I think it's important that we all come to this with a feeling of knowing why we're doing this. Where did this come from? Why is interventional radiology now a separate specialty? So let's look at some milestones for interventional radiology. In 2012, the American Board of Medical Specialties recognized interventional radiology as a unique specialty in medicine with expertise as imagers, proceduralists, and clinician. And I've emphasized the word clinicians because this was sort of the idea of interventional radiologists as clinical decision makers and patient caregivers began in the 1960s with Charles Dodder. And it's taken us over 40 years to get to where we are now. In 2013, the American Board of Radiology recognizes interventional radiology as an independent specialty alongside diagnostic radiology, radiation oncology, and medical physics, and will begin to issue soon a new primary certificate in interventional radiology, diagnostic radiology, indicating competency in these areas of expertise. This is a huge big deal. So what's the impact of interventional radiology as a primary specialty? Specialty status by the American Board, of Radio American Board of Medical Specialties and board certification by a certification board like the American Board of Radiology defines what it means to be a physician specialist in our society. Specialty status and board certification are what are used by our society to set expectations on the quality of health care. Parents use these, patients' parents, patients use these designations. Our clinical colleague physicians use these designations. Healthcare providers, insurers, and quality organizations all look at these designations to indicate quality in providing health care. So specialty status and board certification in this world are the best ways to ensure that interventional radiology, which our healthcare system and our patients need, that interventional radiology exists. So what's the outcome? Well, the outcome is if you've got a specialty and you've got a board cert certificate, you need a residency. Interventional radiology needs a unique 
graduate medical education residency training experience that incorporates robust diagnostic imaging, strong, uh, intense procedural training, and continuity of patient care throughout the residency training program. And these components have been integrated into the IR residency program design and the requirements as they currently exist. So the first thing was the focus. Let's figure out why we're doing this. And the next thing is this particular group of stakeholders needs to know what these new training requirements are because they are, they're really enmeshed with diagnostic radiology. So I'm going to talk about the interventional radiology residency program requirements now with the caveat that these are complicated. This may be the first time you've seen this overview, but you will be hearing this again uh, tomorrow at the RRC update and maybe at the ABR update also. And with the caveat that these program requirements are not yet finalized um, and so changes may occur. Um, in my review of this material with Jean LaBerge, she believes that the part we are communicating is the part that's unlikely to change, but there, this is not final. So the initial draft of the program requirements was submitted to the uh, radiology RRC in December. You can see here the task force members listed on the left and the um, reviewers and participants on the right. Uh, Jean LaBerge did uh, chair it. Um, the RRC reviewed and uh, in committee and unanimously approved the edited IR program requirements this past month. And it's important to note that the voting members of the radiology RRC listed on your left, there's nine of them and eight of those nine are diagnostic radiologists. Only one of the nine is a full-time interventional radiologist. So. Um, with, I think, thorough discussion and modifications, this group of um, experts and stakeholders did view this as a doable and valuable residency. Um, the requirements are currently under review by the ACGME requirement development team. My own personal analysis of that is that these are the T-crossers and the I-daughters and that public comment period is anticipated soon, although I don't exactly know when. And that's the first time we'll all be able to see and comment upon the requirements. After comments are submitted, the task force who wrote the requirements is required to respond to all the comments. They aren't required to change every single thing that the comments request a change on, but they are re required to comment. So that's kind of where the program requirements stand right now. The framework for implementing this residency is that it's going to happen over time. Excuse me. It's anticipated that the ACGME approval will occur towards the end of 2014. If that's in, indeed the case, then uh, programs uh, will begin to submit their PIFs. And this is such a small word for such a big project, right? Um, We'll begin to submit the PIFs in 2015. Obviously, there's about 85 interventional radiology fellowships right now. Obviously, they aren't all 85 going to land on the ACGME desk in one fell swoop, so this will be implemented over a period of years. For the first early adopters of the program, uh, residency, recruitment of residents will begin in 2016, you know, from uh, once they have their program approved. And it's anticipated that based on the rollout of the residency that the uh, fellowships, the current one-year fellowships, will end in about 2022. And the reason for ending the fellowships with the beginning of the residency is that we can't tell society there are two completely different ways to train interventional radiologists. Our society wants sort of one pathway of training, expects. So how is the residency going to be structured? This is sort of an overall uh, concept um, that is, I'd say, the first formal um, manifestation or uh, bringing to reality of the concept of 3-2 training that was um, sort of brought into initial existence um, with the new uh, certification process where we take a core exam at the end of three years and then have two more years uh, 
possibly two more years of training to emphasize in a subspecialty. So PGY one year will continue to be a clinical internship. The PGY two to four years will be the standard diagnostic radiology residency training. So the interventional radiologist can train alongside in exactly the same way as the diagnostic radiologist in a, in a uh, institution. And then the PGY five and six years will be focused IR training that in addition to procedural rotations will include up to four diagnostic radiology rotations if needed, particularly in the areas of mammography and nuclear medicine where there's regulatory requirements. It will include a critical care rotation and throughout those two years include clinical care both inpatient and outpatient. So that's the overall structure, an internship, three years of diagnostic radiology, and, four, and two years of interventional radiology. Within that diagnostic structure, as the people developing the requirements worked and talked with many, many stakeholders, they realized um, that to make this successful, there had to be a degree of flexibility in how these educational goals were achieved because institutions and current programs vary so widely in size and scope and uh, physical location and um, a number of hospitals they're at, et cetera. So what has actually been incorporated into the program requirements, and this is complicated, you're gonna hear this again and it's gonna be publicized more and more, is that there are really two pathways to accomplish these educational goals. One of them is called an integrated program and one of them is called an independent program. There are models to have two pathways to achieve one educational goal in other specialty training programs in our country. These include plastic surgery, thoracic surgery, and vascular surgery, and their um, you know, program requirements are publicly available uh, on the ACGME website if you'd like to see them. For the integrated program, the residents are in one residency program, the IR residency program, for the entire uh, year. They can match in from medical school and their whole experience, the three years of diagnostic and the two years of interventional takes place within their IR residency. The independent program is designed so that residents may enter interventional radiology residency at a later stage of training. And entering residents may be given credit for prior training in another field, i.e. diagnostic radiology, if that training meets certain uh, criteria. So looking a little more closely at the integrated IR residency program, it will be five years of training after internship, three years doing diagnostic radiology, two years doing interventional radiology under an IR program director, and most likely intimately related and married to a diagnostic radiology residency program in the same institution. These people we anticipate over time will mainly match in through medical school, but they may transfer from the diagnostic radiology residency program at the home institution. As written currently, the program requirements do not allow transfer from, an from a diagnostic radiology residency program to an integrated program at another institution. Um, or you could enter the last two years of the integrated program after completion of a diagnostic radiology residency, which could add a year of training. The idea here and the key word that I want you to remember is that this is complicated and the longer I think about it, the harder it is for me to wrap my head around it, but the whole goal behind this complexity is to make uh, the training program as it, training program requirements flexible so that they can be widely adopted. The independent IR residency training program includes two years of training after completion of a four-year diagnostic radiology residency. Um, candidates, any candidate could match into the first year of this independent program the PGY-6 year, but candidates can match into the second year of the program if they come with adequate IR training experience from the DR residency, which on a functional basis means currently our fourth year of residency um, is supposed to include the ability to concentrate in an area or more than one area to do many fellowships, as the residents call them, um, in the fourth year after completion of the core exam. 
The idea here would be that you could, if you could do nine months and get a certain caseload, and the specifics will be shown to you tomorrow, of interventional radiology, during your fourth year of diagnostic radiology residency, you could, trans you could match into a, an independent IR program and just do one more year. Again, the goal here is to maintain the flexibility so that we can have wide adoption of the um, IR residency program. So what does this mean? And I'm going to go through this quickly because you all are going to have to process this stuff and it's complicated. Some departments may focus on getting an independent program where they can mainly recruit from outside, their other, from other institutions or from within their own institution. And development of a robust independent program may be the best option for a current IR fellowship that's not closely affiliated with a uh, residency program or an IR fellowship that's affiliated with a rel relatively small um, diagnostic radiology program. Some may focus on developing an integrated program and focus heavily on recruiting straight from medical school. Some may do both, and this may allow maximum flexibility. And I'll give you an example. Um, my residency program, we have four IR fellows, and we have 40 residents. We have 10 a year. And what I envision doing in the short term is um, actually decreasing my number of diagnostic radiology spots to eight per year and having two IR spots per year, and then trying to um, have an independent program where we can fill our other two uh, IR residency senior spots from outside our program. Okay, so it, the, I, I shudder at the thought of um, working to prepare two PIFs, but I think that this really provides a large degree of flexibility for training programs. And diagnostic radiology residencies without an associated IR fellowship may have multiple options. They may choose and have the facility to develop a parallel um, IR residency, either an independent or an integrated. And they may specifically fashion a uh, PGY-5 diagnostic radiology residency year that makes their senior residents good candidates to transfer into the senior year of an independent IR residency at another institution. So there's a lot of options here. The goal has been to make it flexible, although I'll be the first to say it does make it very complicated. So I'm going to go back to the elements of positive change. What does a diagnostic radiology residency program to get director do with this? Uh, communicate. Communication is going to be key, and there's multiple stakeholders. I think the first communication has to be between the IR program director, the diagnostic radiology program director, and their department chair to figure out how they want to try to um, manage this IR residency in their institution. And then there's all kinds of other stakeholders that need to be included in the discussions. But the interest in IR is really on the rise. Um, medical students are increasingly asking for IR electives and IR away rotations. IR student interest groups are becoming common. Um, we had last week 120 medical students come to the SIR meeting and there's over 400 uh, medical students who are medical student members of SIR. I think this is a very exciting opportunity and I hope that um, I've begun to help you guys, us guys, think that although this will be a lot of work, the time is right and it's really worth it for the future of interventional radiology. Thank you. And our last speaker of uh, this morning's session is Hart Betty, who's going to talk about some resources to help residents achieve the tougher milestones. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, I want to thank Janet for inviting me uh, to speak today. I want to thank my distinguished panel uh, and thank Petra for continuing to make me feel inadequate as a program director on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> so thank you. Not sure for that. So when Janet uh, first approached me, she said, Harp, can you talk about difficult milestones? And I said, well, I'm very flattered, Janet. Thank you. I, I will do that. Um, and I, I started thinking, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, the first difficult milestone really is getting married. So 
you know, I would recommend everybody to just be themselves. And I did some research on this, and those who deserve, those people who believe like they deserve happiness are the ones that get happiness. So feel like you deserve it. I, you know, I went through some, some sites <laughs> for you. But, you know, then it dawned on me, maybe she's talking about radiology milestones and not life milestones. So I had to rethink the talk. But, so we'll go through some of the radiology milestones. Um, identifying challenges and a few of the milestones and sort of um, strategize. So there, I will say this about the milestones for radiology. And this comes from our GME meetings at Tufts. When we sit down with all the program directors and our DIO, they are unbelievably impressed with the work that radiology has done as a field in milestones. And I think we have um, a committee that deserves, deserves a lot of credit and all the effort that they've put into this. And we are ahead of the game, believe it or not, compared to many other subspecialties because we've provided miles, milestones for our landscape and resources to achieve them. So I think um, the committee gets a lot of credit for that. I sort of went through the four T's of milestones here. Um, first of all, it, is a milestone tangible? And in what sense is it tangible? How does it tie into your day-to-day -day practice? Um, is it teachable? And finally, is it testable? So going through this process is sort of helpful when you're, um, when you're looking at milestones at your institution. So first of all, is it tangible? Um, there are milestones, as Petra, some of this will overlap with what, what Petra said, there are milestones that are certainly deemed a little bit more tangible than others. And I think image interpretation, medical knowledge, uh, basic interactions, those are milestones that are fairly tangible. If you look at level one, can make core observations, formulates differential diagnosis, recognizes critical findings. You can do this as an attending at the workstation. You can, you can see these things that are a little bit more tangible. Some things that are a little less tangible, uh, patient advocacy, a little bit less tangible for us to evaluate that. Ethics and values, sporadic events. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge for tangibility of some of these things. Next, the tie-in piece. So how does this tie in to your day-to-day -day life? So as a neuroradiologist, we may be able to assess their medical knowledge in, in, in neuro. It ties into my day-to-day -day practice, certainly. Um, the physicists may be able to do some of these things that tie into their day-to-day uh, -day practice. There are some things that may not tie into day-to-day -day practice for us as neuroradiologists, whatever specialty we are. We should be thinking about imaging costs, but as a neuroradiologist at the workstation every day, am I going to assess their knowledge of imaging costs on a day-to-day -day practice, I'm trying to get through a work list? Day-to-day -day ethics, as my role as a neuroradiologist, how am I going to evaluate day-to-day -day ethics? And I think this goes to the point that Petra was uh, making. Making subspecialty-specific milestones is really going to help you. And it's OK to eliminate some of those that are not necessarily appropriate to your day-to-day -day workflow. You may also want to develop subcommittees. Maybe there's an ethics committee that will take charge in evaluating the ethics piece of milestones. So you have some of those options and some of that flexibility, but it's okay, I think, um, if it doesn't necessarily tie into your day-to-day -day practice to leave that out of that, pe that piece out of your evaluations and just leave the more appropriate pieces into that. So how does it tie in as sort of an important piece? Um, next, is it teachable? There are things that are more teachable, uh, are milestones certainly that are more teachable than others. And, um, develops an annual learning plan. We can, we can go through their readings like Petra suggested, suggest readings, make sure they're doing them, go through these exercises of if they are becoming good self-directed learners, diagnostic growth, interventional skills certainly are, are teachable and accessible. There are other milestones that are a little bit tougher to teach, and some of them state that they want um, the residents to be team leaders. I think that's a level two or level three milestone. It, it doesn't necessarily how are we going to teach them to be team leaders if we're assessing them as team leaders? So we at our own institutions need to go through some of, those, uh, so, uh, some of that thinking on how are we doing that if it's not fair to them to assess them as team leaders if we're not teaching them how to do it appropriately. So um, teaching ethics, uh, a, lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of institutions have their own ways of doing that. 
and, and teaching leadership and being culturally aware. So some of these things, again, are a little bit more teachable um, than others. Finally, is it, oh, is it testable? Some things are certainly testable. We have mechanisms to test. Um, you know, pimping at the monitor with readouts and in-service examinations and case conferences, uh, sort of a more concrete ways to test. You know, testing other milestones may be a little bit more challenging, and I sort of give the example of ethics. Um, testing, even if you do well on an ethics test, doesn't make you necessarily ethical. You know, I know a lot about Major League Baseball. You could give me a quiz on it. That doesn't make me a Red Sox by any means. <laughs> you know, so it's a little bit of a challenge on the testable piece and how we are actually, is it a, are they actually ethical people and how are we going to assess that appropriately short of just taking a test? We all have residents that are off the charts on tests and we're like, oh man, I'm worried about this guy. Um, because there's more to it than just being able to take that test. Patient experiences and, you know, again, the leadership piece, how are we defining them as leaders? How are we training them to become leaders? Are they taking more active roles in tumor boards, for example? Uh, are they taking more active roles in getting working groups together in your residency program? Are they taking their own initiative in doing these things? And how are we assessing those appropriately um, for them? And uh, again, our, how much of that is actually testable? So we chose um, to get a small team together and sort of put the healthcare economics milestone in our crosshairs and see uh, if we could come up with some helpful things for this milestone and really just putting these into buckets. So the level one through five and coming up with different resources, uh, PowerPoint presentations and papers and websites that I think we, we have a little bit of an, uh, a dilemma with the discrepancy between small and large programs. And I talk to a lot of the leadership at large programs and I'll say, uh, how are you guys fulfilling your healthcare economics milestones? Well, they just attend our four week course. And I'm like, well, that's great. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy for you and your four week course. Uh, many of us uh, don't have those resources necessarily. So we chose to um, go out and do a search of PowerPoints, do a search of PDFs and websites that could be made available to every program um, that would fulfill the milestones that we could make public for everybody. And we're gonna be working on assessments for that as well. So we went through this with PowerPoint presentations, papers, and websites, and we started throwing them into buckets. And you know, this is a very popular series that uh, David has from Hopkins uh, so we had residents, uh, Deb, your resident watched all the videos, all of them. And the conclusion was you could fulfill levels one through four by the first video. <laughs> and you're done, you're all set. So again, like we were emphasizing before, it's one thing to take the philosophy of checking off the box with milestones, but I don't think we should do that. We should really use this as a, an opportunity to really get true and pure training in some of these things that are very important. So watching the first video will take you through level one through four with, uh, with David's videos, but you know, there are other resources that will take you to a sort of a deeper dive at each level. And some of these articles that we've, uh, we've looked into will allow you to do that. So describe mechanisms for reimbursement, including types of payers. There's some great literature out there that will help you do it. It's all free, and um, we can make that available at this very common site. So level two, states cost of common procedures. CMS.gov will give you the cost of procedures. And there's a PDF that will help you do that as well. That will help you achieve that level two in addition to a video that you may watch in your program. Uh, other resources for level three describes the technical and professional components of imaging costs. These are documents that are available for free to everybody and uh, will help you fulfill that level three. We felt sort of in the end that level three and level four were very much tied into one another, but um, there are other resources that will help you get through the level four document uh, uh, piece of it. So it, the resources are out there. It's a matter of going through them, putting them in buckets, and coming up with an assessment tool 
that everybody's agreeable to that get you through these milestones. So I think it's a real opportunity. Uh, level five, uh, you know, we're sort of working on that. But um, it is a bit of an opportunity. Now, if the resources are not necessarily there, there's no reason we can't create the content. And we can do that as a landscape to say, and the other thing we could do is many of you have content already. And if that content is shareable, we could create resources and that everybody could tap into that content. If the people that have four week uh, business of radiology courses are videotaping those lectures and are willing to share those lectures, we can go through those and help put those lectures into buckets that everybody can benefit from. So there's an opportunity to connect with one another. There's certainly an opportunity to collaborate with one another um, to make that content piece more robust and more appropriate um, for the entire landscape uh, of academic radiology. Um, and coming up with an assessment tool. So we're working on an assessment tool that we're going to be you know, moderately happy with. We'll vet that with people, with MBAs and all this stuff to make sure we are satisfying from an assessment piece the level one through five milestones. Um, so really, I mean, it's a quick talk, but the milestone challenges, the, again, the, the things that we go through, are they sort of tangible? How do they tie into day-to-day -day workflow? Are they teachable and are they testable? I think really it's an opportunity for a forum discussion. And Petra is, uh, you know, I think an ideal example of somebody who's gone through, a t done a ton of work, but willing to share that work. And the more people that we have, I think creating everything at each individual institution, we tend to waste a lot of time doing that when we could easily come up with something that everybody is agreeable on and share that content with everybody. So a lot of this collaborative piece will save us all a lot of time and effort. And um, I think that's the direction we should move into because um, it just makes all of our lives, as everybody's said, the, you know, our program director uh, piece is very busy and time consuming and for everybody to create their own milestone specific subspecialty evaluations. That's a lot of work. So um, it's certainly an opportunity for forum discussion. It's certainly an opportunity for collaboration and coming up with strategies that we all sort of can agree upon that think we're going to fulfill these milestones, but not just check the box off, make them as enriching and as robust for our residents as possible. So. Um, you know, in the end, I, I don't think the milestones of life are very different than the milestones of, you just gotta believe that you deserve to be loved as a program director. <laughs> <laughs> and you will be. Stay confident in that. So uh, in the end, I just wanna say thanks to Eric Lederman and Alan for helping me with the content and the slides here. So um, I'll wrap it up a minute early. Thank you. We have time for questions. Hi, good morning, Jamal from uh, uh, Yale, from Program Director. I have, uh, as usual, uh, too many questions uh, to allow for the time, so I'll just stick to uh, one set of questions, and that's for Dr. Marks, Victoria. Don't mean to be the tough one in the crowd, but I think look, listening to the IRDR uh, um, talk, it seems like the only thing I can think of is uh, Yogi Berra when he said that if you come to a fork in, in the road, take it. And I think that what uh, in radiology, what it seems like what we've done is that uh, we've come to multiple forks in the road and we've taken them, all of them, in terms of the IRDR choice. What that it seems like is happening is that uh, it leads to multiple questions. And the key one as a program director for me is, from all the choices you've laid out, if I and the IR program director say that this is the choice that we want to stick with, that in our residency, we are going to do have one selection process, and, and the second end of the second year, beginning of third year, we're going to decide from our current batch of residents who you want for your IRDR program. We'll make that selection at that time, and then you'll be the program director for that just as a sample, if that's the choice we stick with, can we actually do that and ignore the other choices? I'm, the microphone quality is a little bit poor, and I, can you repeat your question again? 
Let me see if I can, if I got this right. I think your question was, if, if regarding the different choices of IR and DR programs, whether it's independent, depend, or um, integrated. Integrated. Sorry, um, thanks the term. Can one change our mind later on, or are you going to be stuck into that particular format? Is that correct? Well, I mean, clearly, from uh, what uh, Victoria has described, there are now, previously, from what we were told, there was one choice. There's going to be a new, new program, independent with the new program director. Now, it clear, clearly, there are multiple choices, right? You could take the integrated program. You can take the independent program. You can choose who goes into IRDR of, out of medical school. You can choose them out of your own residency. You can choose them from some other residency, which right. is pretty much similar to a fellowship. So as a program director now, this clearly blurs the lines of responsibility as who will be responsible for those residents. So can I just pick one choice of all these multiple choices that we can potentially do and just stick with it in, in understanding with, within the department? And will that be okay with ACGM? So could you just, could you say, I want an integrated program and I will only accept people from medical school? or the other way around, or that, uh, that I will only choose... I, I think that you can uh, be as rigid as you want in implementing these programs, or this pro an IR residency. I think you can be rigid. The benefit of flexibility, certainly in the early years of implementation, is that it will, I think, widen the prospects of capturing candidates and filling your spots. Yeah. But yes, if you want to, um, the, simple, the simplest scenario for me to understand is to say, I'm gonna have an integrated program and I'm just gonna accept people straight out of medical school. So in 2016, I'm gonna interview applicants and I'm gonna pick uh, an, somebody to join the IR residency. They will start with me in 2017. During their years of residency, I'll still have a fellowship until they mature to that fifth year, and then the fellowship will be gone. You could certainly do that. I see, and if you do have an integrated program, then do you actually have to teach IR to the residents who are not in the integrated program. Integra so interventional wide. radiology is still part of diagnostic radiology to the extent that it currently is. So I would say a standard in the um, training program model we currently have is for residents to do about three rotations in interventional radiology during their diagnostic radiology residency, and that expectation continues, and that material will still be part of the core exam. Let's move on to the next Thank question. Yeah. A much simpler question. My name is Tom Gates from LSU and Shreveport. Dr. Marks, you had said that you, you're the DR program director right now, and you were going to have to make another PIF for the IR. Well, I have it, a... It has to I, be we have an IR program director, okay. but I know that he's going to need a little help. Okay, so it, the, <laughs> the DR program director has to be totally different than the IR program director. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Larry? Larry Davis from North Shore LIJ. I don't have a question. I do have a couple of comments. Uh, first, putting on my program director hat, I'd like to thank the panelists. I thought this was a fabulous presentation of all the new things in... Uh, in radiology, of course, it stole a lot of my thunder for my presentation tomorrow, but you'll hear it all again. Um, like Harp said, I especially want to thank Petra for, after 30 years, showing me how much better I can be as program director. Um, give me a break, I just, guys. <laughs> I just wish you hadn't done it when I was sitting next to my chair, who was nudging me during most of what you were saying, saying, how come you're not doing that? I'm not the program director. Steve Sargent deserves but all the credit. What I did want to comment, putting on my RRC hat, is we have a bigger challenge ahead of us as programs. And it's not the core programs. I think the core programs now are so engaged in milestones, CCCs, the NAS, we all kind of get it. And I'm guessing that everybody, or 95% of the people sitting in this audience are related to the core programs. I think the challenge now for all of our departments are the fellowships. Please let's not forget 
that the fellowship milestones have just come on board. They're, they're uh, on the website. They kick in this coming up July, which is what, three months from now. The fellowships need to start working on this, getting their CCCs and all this stuff. And that means there are six different milestones because there are six different ACGME approved fellowships. We have a huge, we as a department. Uh, Larry, for and, each of those fellowships, mm -hmm. you know, we have one neuroimaging fellow. Do we have to have a different CCC for each fellowship? Well, it, or the, is the CCC going to be responsible for them? Well, I'm guessing you have only one neuro person, if any, on your current CCC. So how is that person really going to be able to evaluate that neuro fellow? The thought, I think, is, at least what we're planning to do in our department, is to have the faculty in neuroradiology be their own CCC. So, so each of these fellowships will need a, a, an individual CCC you can on do, top of the one. There's a lot of flexibility. You can do yeah. whichever way works. Personally, I think it is clearly a better evaluation process if my four neuroradiologists, whatever, are the ones evaluating that resident fellow in neuroradiology and not the mammographer who's on my CCC. But I do think we have a challenge here because I don't think the fellowship directors know any of the words I've just said. In my no. program, the only reason they knew this is because many of you know me and I'm very obsessive and I nudge everybody. So I nudge them and starting to get them going. This is, and you're gonna hear me say this again at my presentation tomorrow. This is my plea to everybody sitting in the room to let's start engaging our fellowship people to, to realize they need to do this process as well. And they're gonna need a lot of help because they don't know any of these words. Thank you, Larry. And the next question. Hi, thank you. I'm Jim Milburn from the Oxner Clinic. Thank you for all the excellent presentations. I was particularly interested in the DR, IR, you know, fellowship program. Um, there's, I'm worried that there's potential for collateral damage to programs like mine who tend to recruit residents who, uh, because we don't have a fellowship in IR, who come and they get to work directly with staff and get a lot of intense IR experience doing a lot of heavy things. Um, so do you recommend a program, you know, in, like for example, last year of my five residents, three of them went into IR. So in the future, I may not get any of those residents. We may get mostly patient, or people who don't want to do IR, which would, you know, be a, I would, I would not prefer that. So uh, would you recommend that we form a fellowship or do, you, or do you think there will be enough? I know you, there, you said there's a separate pathway to create that last year. Uh, to fulfill the requirements. Do you think there will be enough positions left to still make a program like mine at, at Auctioner able to recruit people who are IR minded? Um, the questions you raise have been raised before and have been on the minds of the task force who put the requirements together. Um, I have two thoughts. The first goes back to my early slide where I do think we're in a position of not knowing how this is all going to shake out. And um, my other suggestion that I do think that small, smaller programs or diagnostic radiology residency programs who do not have a fellowship need to um, seriously look at those two options of creating an IR pathway or and or uh, creating a model where at least one resident a year could do a very intense PGY-5 year in interventional radiology to satisfy the requirements to transfer into an independent program at a senior level. I think those are two things that um, need to be carefully uh, considered and that you're not considering them may limit your applicant pool. Thank you. Given the current climate and job market. Next question. Hi, thank you very much for some great presentations. Uh, I'm Daniel Lockwood from the Cleveland Clinic Residency Program. Uh, I have a question about the IRDR program. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> on the hot seat today, <laughs> and, Vicky, sorry. I, I knew this, this really, was going to happen. This really comes from my experience interviewing applicants for our residency program, and I don't know how many people have the same experience, but it seems like when I'm talking to medical students interested in radiology, about two-thirds or maybe even three-quarters of them say that they got interested in it through 
interventional radiology, which is great. It's, you know, it's an exciting hands-on field that's easy for them to, to get into. But then at our program of, of our residents, we have eight a year, uh, usually about one, maybe two, will end up going into interventional radiology. And I just wonder whether medical school is the right time for these people to be deciding that they are headed for interventional radiology and not some of the diagnostic specialties. Um, I do think that that's a valid question. Um, the the way the, um, I, I've got all kinds of thoughts running through my head. Um, one is that we have um, not tapped into effectively the entire applicant pool of people who might want to do interventional radiology, so that we're going to broaden the applicant pool a little bit by making it um, available straight from medical school. Um, I think that with the increase in IR, medical student rotations and interest groups, they will have more of a forum moving forward to sort of figure out whether they're really interested in IR or not. Um, I think that your statistics are about right. About 15 to 20 percent of diagnostic radiology residents currently go on to do IR fellowships across the country on average. Um, and that the way the the program requirements are being written, I do think that if you have parallel integrated IR residency with a DR residency, you could transfer out and into your diagnostic radiology residency um, in the, say, PGY3 year. Now, the, the difficulty is that you, each residency has a uh, complement, right? So when I mentioned that I might uh, give two of my residency slots from diagnostic to interventional per year, I'm not going to go to the ACGME and ask to decrease my complement so that if I have somebody who wants to transfer back, they could do that. Now then, you, then in that first three years, PGY 2 to 4, you're not changing your pool of residents to learn and get milestones and get the work done and take call, but they'll be working under different hats. I, I do think that we really don't know what the, um, what the rate of people changing their minds is going to be. Now, I will say that in the world of thoracic surgery, vascular surgery, and plastic surgery, and I'm most familiar with plastic surgery because my husband runs a plastic surgery residency program, they didn't used to get people straight out of medical school, and now they do, and it's rare for somebody to change their mind. I think, Vicki, this also points out that, the, that keeping your structure as flexible as possible so that if you have a resident switch from the IR to the DR, you don't suddenly two years later have no, you're missing a, an IR fellow, that you have the, the possibility of, of taking, bringing of bringing in an external person into yeah. that slot. I think you guys are all bringing up wonderful questions that it will take time to see how it, uh, how we all manage them. Okay, well, one quick question and then finish the session. Uh, Scott Adams from uh, LSU Shreveport. Thank you all for the very informative lectures. I have a, actually have a question for, uh, for Dr. Lewis. Um, oh, our God. Clinical, <laughs> our clinical competence, competence committee that we have right now, um, the problems we're running into, it, we're finding it difficult to find staff who are willing to actually take part in the process. Do you have any advice to uh, <laughs> maybe help with that? Well, bribery. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, we, we didn't have that much problem. I, mean, I think if you very clearly define how often people are going to meet, a lot of the work was up front. So now we're sort of more on a you know, even plane. Very clearly define what their expectations are. You provide get the program coordinator to get the resources together in an efficient way such the data's there. You know, we um, specifically assign them um, each of those pairs, non-clinical time, off the schedule, designated as this is when you're doing your reviews so they're not scrambling around to find meeting time together. We try and do split the meetings up as far as possible. Um, and we, as I said before, part of our incentive that we get at the end of the year takes a lot of factors into account, and one of them is serving on this committee. One of them is fulfilling resident evaluations. So there is a little bit of a 
a carrot there. You know, it's everybody's stressed and everybody, this is one more thing to do. But we actually generated a lot of, didn't we, Sarge? I mean, a very enthusiastic committee who was very dedicated to doing this process right. All right, Sarge. I, I can't cut off my own program, chair, <laughs> <laughs> director. Thank you. Steve, Steve Sargent from, from Dartmouth. Um, I, the train may be too far down the tracks, but as I've thought about this IR, DR, and DR split, it seems to me that what happened was quite a number of years ago, the two, two things happened in, in tandem that we could actually bring back together, potentially. A number of years ago, Skiver correctly decided, I think, that IR residents needed more than just a one-year fellowship. They needed more clinical time and more IR time. So that process got launched to change what it means to be an IR-trained physician. Then the, the board decided to change the structure of the, of the board examination with the core after three years, et cetera, as you all know. What about saying, bringing these processes back together by saying, if you apply in your third year to the skiver match and you match, you are committing to a fourth year that is, looks like the first year of the two year, the last two years of the IRDR program. And then you, you go on to, your, to apply to fellowship programs just as um, you do now. The end result of that would be that by the time you finish your IR fellowship, your one year IR fellowship, you will have had those two intensive years of, of IR focus. In other words, I think you can end up with the same experience you doing this, but it doesn't create, a, it doesn't blow up the whole existing structure and create this problem for, which I think is very, very real, of making it certainly more difficult to think you want to do IR and then decide, no, you want to do body imaging or vice versa. Well, you know, I, I think those are very valid points, so, but so I, we, we, we're probably, I think the process has moved on. And but uh, it's but, just, it struck me last year, I've been thinking about okay. it all year, that we could have, if these two processes happened to happen, had happened at the same time, I think, I, I think we could have done it without blowing up yeah. the structure and creating a whole new residency right. tract. Thank you very much, everybody, for the session.